Hi there, thank you for joining. We'll get going in a minute or a minute or so. If you feel like it, why don't you let us know? Great, I see someone already did it without a prompting, without a prompt. But if anyone else wants to tell us where they're joining from, um, just so you know, I'm Kim Allman and I'm joining from Washington, DC, and I'll tell you a little bit more about my role in a second. But thanks again for joining us. Pittsburgh, all right. Fort Lauderdale, Chattanooga. Cottonwood, Arizona. All over, I love to see it. Thanks for joining. Oakland, Florence. Thanks for joining everyone. We're just gonna give folks a little bit more time to join us. Thanks, everybody. Uh, we'll get started in just a second. If you feel like it, throw where you're joining us from in the chat, and we'll be with you in a second. So hi, everyone. Um, welcome to our conversation on digital empowerment, safeguarding survivors of domestic violence, human trafficking, and sexual assault. My name is Kim Allman. I'm with a company called Gen Digital, and we have a product that we are representing here today called Norton that we partner with TechSoup uh, and the National Network to End Domestic Violence. I'm actually pinch hitting for a great partner of ours at TechSoup called Joe Lee Bells. So I am delighted to have you join us for this crucial conversation that addresses the intersection of technology and the safety of survivors. In today's rapidly evolving digital landscape, it is imperative to explore innovative ways to empower and protect these vulnerable groups. This conversation today aims to shed light on the challenges survivors face in the digital realm while fostering a discussion on the strategies and some of the tools that can enhance their digital security and resilience. We are privileged to have experts from the National Network to End Domestic Violence, as well as some of my colleagues from Norton, and to share their insights and make the conversation an invaluable resource for understanding and addressing the digital dimensions of survivor support. A couple of technical uh, housekeeping things Here's how to engage today so that everyone can hear and participate. We want you to engage and share your thoughts in the chat. Ask your questions for the panelists using the Q&A tab located at the bottom of your screen. We will leave time at the end of the discussion to address any questions, but we've got a robust agenda. So if we don't, we'll make sure that we have mechanisms to get your questions answered. Closed captioning is available. Turn it on with the CC button, the closed caption button located in your Zoom menu. And now I'd like to turn it over to our panelists, um, starting with Armin, to talk to you and introduce themselves. And we'll go to Armin, then Jesse, then Aaron. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Armin Vasicek. I am uh, part of Norton. And more specifically, I work for Norton in the research branch. So I work on a variety of topics uh, that concern society and how we use technology as a society, as well as finding new ways of uh, helping people, uh, helping to protect people. So the mission of Norton is 
to create solutions for people to take full advantage of the digital world safely, privately, and confidently. And for that, uh, I have worked on solutions regarding phishing, scam protection, network and IoT security. I've pioneered some privacy and identity solutions. And uh, most recently, I also worked on cyber hygiene um, that helps to us to form safe digital habits. And my personal goal is to find new ways of how we can transition the solutions into the products and make them available for everyone to use. Thanks, Armin. Jesse? Hey, everybody, and thank you for showing up for this. Um, my name is Jesse Lowell. Um, I use either they, them, or she, her pronouns. Um, I am a technology safety specialist on the safety net team, which is one of several teams uh, at the National Network to End Domestic Violence. Uh, we work on issues related to um, tech safety and gender-based violence. Um, I, one of the reasons that I'm on, that I'm the one on this panel is because I was the primary author of the Securing Devices and Accounts uh, resource that we'll talk about later. Um, I live in the Boston area. Um, before this job, I was an advocate in the housing programs at the Network Lored, um, which I, I see some of you are Boston area folks, so you might um, you might know that name. It's a, a domestic violence agency serving um, LGBTQ plus polyamorous and BDSM community survivors. Um, I have. I was previously in academic computer science while volunteering in the anti-gender based violence world. I have a PhD in computer science. Um, I'm an international association of privacy professionals certified um, inf information privacy technologist. Um, and I, I also, before I had this job, was consulting and freelancing on digital security things as a side gig, which is how I got this job. Um, I used to be the volunteer intelligence team lead for Operation Safe Escape, which is a volunteer group of tech professionals who uh, provide direct tech safety services to survivors. So <laughs> that's me. <laughs> Thanks, Jesse. Um, Aaron. Thank you, Kim. And thanks, Jesse and Armin, for being on this panel. I'm really looking forward to hearing from both of you on these important topics. Um, my name is Erin Gallegos, and I'm actually based in Prague, where I am a part of Jen's corporate responsibility team. So Jen being the company which has the consumer brands Norton, which we're representing and talking about today, as well as Avast and Avira and others you might be familiar with. And my role at Jen is um, leading our product donation program, as well as the partnership with TechSoup, um, our EMEA philanthropy, and employee engagement in our corporate responsibility programs. And so I'm delighted to be here today um, as part of my work with, with TechSoup and with NNEDV through that partnership with TechSoup where we've launched this innovative product donation program to try to bring um, some of our security products directly to uh, victims and survivors of domestic violence but doing that in such a way that it is through the services of organizations which are already addressing those communities and are competent to help them navigate the really challenging issues of tech abuse and stalkerware and the the risks and vulnerabilities that they face there so um I am definitely not the expert that Armin and Jesse are. You'll hear certainly more from them than from me, but I'm very happy to be supporting this from the partnership and the CSR side. Thanks so much, Erin. So let's tap into the expertise we have here on the panel today and get to some, some questions. Um, let's start with Jesse, and then Armin, I'm going to kick it over to you after Jesse. Um, but Armin, can you please explain, or Jesse, I said start with, I'm sorry. Um, Jesse, can you 
explain to us the importance of digital security with regard to safety and privacy of survivors of domestic violence? Absolutely. Um, <clears throat> so the contemporary world, as I suspect many of you know, is it's very online, very technology based. Um, and so, you know, when we've done needs assessments, uh, well over 90% of providers, I don't remember the exact number offhand, um, ha have mentioned, have said that they have dealt with cases that involve tech facilitated gender-based violence. Um, unfortunately, traditionally the tech world and the victim services world have been very compartmentalized from each other with, and, and I say this as somebody who has been in both um, extremely different cultures. Um, and so that, that there's often been a real lack of collaboration and communication, but it's so necessary for survivors um, because uh, it, it, it's very common for an abuser to monitor a survivor using technology. Um, abusers may have access to survivors' passwords. They may use stalkerware or, or less comprehensive means to track them. Um, there may be issues as simple as the survivor leaves but is still on the same family plan for a phone and that can be used to um, to track them. Meanwhile, survivors are getting uh, services from agencies that um, may be hybrid and even if they're not, they probably use a fair amount of office technology, um, whether that's storing their data, um, doing meetings with other social services by Zoom um, in, in order to advocate for uh, the survivors they work with. Um, obviously during the pandemic, there were a lot of remote services. And so it, um, you know, there, there has to be security and confidentiality in those services as well. And then you get complications like, what if a shelter has a confidential location, but its its address somehow ends up on, you know, Google Business or, or some other listing? Like, we have a whole resource about that. Finally, survivors use technology strategically. Like, we have a very strong opinion at SafetyNet that technology is not the enemy. Technology, it, it's, it's a tool. It can be misused. It can be used strategically. It can be used for protection of survivors and providers' uh, privacy and cybersecurity. Um, it can be it, it can be used for survivor by survivors to maintain their support networks because so often abusers isolate survivors. Technology can be used to overcome that. Um, or, or, or at least to mitigate it. Um, it can be used by uh, survivors who live in rural areas to access services that may not exist in their area. And, and many, many more potential uses. And, and, and so it, it has just become ever more important over the years for the, these worlds to be able to collaborate and, and to talk to each other, which is one reason I think this partnership is great. Thanks, Jesse. Really important points you made. I think now let's turn to Armin. If you want to, from your perspective, Armin, and from the perspective, I guess, of what we see as Norton, can you talk about the importance of digital security with regard to the safety and privacy of survivors? I Sorry, I was a mute. Yeah, hey, yes, uh, definitely. So uh, I can just uh, reciprocate what, what Jesse just said. It's, it's very much also how we as Norton, as a digital security company, see the world. So it's not technology by itself. Technology is agnostic of the intention that how you use it. 
it can be used in, in many different ways. It can be used in good ways. It can help you to connect. It can help you to establish community and uh, do things, but it also can be used for bad. And so these days, it's hard to live your life without using the technology. So no, no matter in what situation you are, for getting to your job, for getting for, for doing financing and, and stuff, you have to use technology. So you can't just reject technology as part of a situation, but you have to learn how to use it and how to live with it and how to use it to your advantage and prevent others from using it to your disadvantage. So right. that, that's the important thing. So internet, mobile technologies, these are kind of the most important technology that everyone can't uh, stop using. And uh, as much as we love our phone, for example, and mobile phone is a very complex technical thing. Uh, so as much as we love it and as much as we make it part of our life, we have to, be, to, to create this awareness for ourselves, how it can be used and how it can be abused, for example, uh, uh, so that uh, we don't fall in this, in, in, into this trap. Uh, so we as a society need to develop also a better understanding of how this world works. And information is always kind of the tool that I would recommend everyone uh, and education to help themselves and help getting uh, getting in control of uh, what happens. So uh, Irma, let me ask you to take that a, a step further. And then Jesse, I will ask you the same thing, which is how, how can you make, what are some of the ways that you can um, address online safety stipulating that there isn't a one size fit all, fits all for anybody. Um, but how, what, what's are some measures you can take for online safety and security that help survivors of domestic violence or some that they may be able to take? Armin, I'm gonna ask you first. Oh, yes. Uh, so uh, uh, I, I'm trying to speak about, so we have a concept that we call cyber hygiene. I think that's a very important concept. This relates to uh, forming a safe digital online habits. And this means uh, in the in the world of security, uh, we, we can do something to avoid that something bad can happen. And this is very much what cyber hygiene associates to. We also have tools that we commercially produce as a, as a company uh, that help you prevent things from going wrong. But it starts all with the user and how you behave, what you do online, what actions you take. And some are better than others. For example, having a good password, like Jesse said, is kind of uh, better for your digital uh, hygiene than having like a unsafe password, like password123, or uh, I don't know what people use. And for that purpose, having password managers, for example, that help you kind of keep track of these more safer, more complex, but safer passwords might be a tool uh, further down the road. So the, the research that Jesse came up with the securing devices and accounts is a very good guide in helping you getting a, a sense of uh, what kind of measures everyone can take. And it's very much in line of our concepts of, of uh, cyber hygiene. In, in our products, we try to build more and more into that. So also to help people, to educate people and help people form these safer digital habits. So this is kind of part of the core of what, at the core of what we're doing as a company in our products. That's great. Thank you. And so, Jesse, um, I'll ask you the same thing. You know, wh what are your thoughts on on measures mm -hmm. for online safety and security for for survivors? So my that's a great question. And my thoughts. Um, well, first of all, I, I want to make a point that I always try to make in trainings and webinars, which is that I think a lot of providers, a lot of advocates like everyone has their area of expertise and for many providers and advocates, they don't think of technology as being one of their areas of expertise. And so they tend to be intimidated when a survivor is experiencing tech facilitated gender-based violence. Um, and the point I always try to make is that you don't have to be because as advocates, as providers, you know how to safety plan. Um, you know how to look at a survivor's individual situation, their individual risk factors, um, the barriers that they might have in their lives to doing um, what like someone who doesn't know this area that well might say they should do, and then coming up with plans with them to help them navigate all these factors. 
and tech safety. Tech safety is part of safety planning. Um, it's useful to know a little bit about the tech and that's part of where we come in, but you already know how to safety plan. In terms of specific things that tend to come up a lot, um, it's often better to go for, to, to start by trying the low hanging fruit, the things that are relatively easier rather than relatively harder. Um, some common ones that I, I, I think come up are um, abusers being able to access survivors' accounts and like the risks that that poses. And they, it may not be safe for them to just shut an abuser out of their accounts. Maybe it is, maybe it isn't. If it's not, how can they use technology to still be able to communicate securely with people? If it is, do, do, do they want uh, help in shutting the abuser out of their accounts? Um, again, is there an issue with a family plan, a family phone plan? That's, that's such a common one um, with children especially in co-parenting situations. There's a whole range of issues um, around children and uh, survivors learning like what some of the um, lost device finder items like um, you know pet finders and air tags and tiles like what more or less what they look like and how and where to search for them because they might be placed in a in a child's clothing or gifts. Um, mm. Does the abuser have access to um, the children's devices? And if so, uh, what can be done about that? So oh, I think Jesse Furrows. Well, let me, um, until Jesse, we get Jesse back. Oh, Jesse, you're back. Okay. You first. Okay. I, I don't know where I got cut off, um, but I, I was saying that I'm posing some of this as questions more than answers because these are the things that tend to come up a lot in technology safety planning. I think that good cyber hygiene is beneficial for everyone. I think that if there's children, th there are child-friendly um, cybersecurity uh, lessons online, and it's it's an activity that you know survivor parents and and their children can do together as a family, like learn about cybersecurity um, and cyber hygiene. Passwords. One thing that comes up a lot in the U.S., but I think is less common in a lot of other countries because they have better data privacy laws, um, is uh, people appearing in, you know, online people search sites that that are data brokers and. Uh, like most adults in the U.S., if they haven't specifically opted out, um, they're their home address, their past home addresses, their phone numbers, their email addresses are all available freely online and may indeed come up in Google searches. And people don't know this. Um, so I, I think that at least in the U.S., often one of the low hanging fruit bits, especially if survivors have relocated away from their abuser, is like protecting the new home address, which can include um, addressing this issue of data brokers and how to remove yourself from them. That's a huge issue. I don't know, Armin, if you want to add anything there from the Norton perspective, we see that quite a bit. Uh, yeah, definitely. So this is a very, very important issue, the, the, how your data, your personal data, that you leave out in on the, on the internet while interacting that might be collected without your consent or even without your knowledge in, for example, just public databases. In, in, in Norton, we refer to that as your digital footprint. So these are all the traces that you leave behind when when you're online as, as part of just being online. So the logs that being taken when you surf the web, 
the data that you enter into forms when you register for an account and so on. And, and, and taking control of that is really hard. This is a problem that we're trying to solve that we're working towards solving. So specifically, this pub and we have a few products that are already working out in this direction, specifically uh, this public database and also the dark web monitoring are things that, that we are pursuing. So uh, if you're interested in, in getting a sense of that, I think we can share it maybe later. Uh, we just came online or we should be able to come online very soon. It's like a, a tool on our homepage that helps you give a better understanding, which is kind of free to use for everyone. And then of course we, we make some offer of our products. But just to give you a sense of what data is out there, this is often the very first, uh, very important first step for people to, to create this awareness and to realize actually the amount of data and, and, and that's actually available. And then of course you can take steps to kind of reduce your digital footprint to, to talk to or to write to these um, uh, public data brokers to kind of remove, get removed there. And I have to say, this is unfortunately an era that's very hard. So Jesse spoke about the uh, privacy regulations of other countries. So for example, in the European Union, we have the GDPR and this uh, has this right to be forgotten. And this is right to be forgotten is unfortunately not aligned with how the internet works, the technology works. Because like you might have heard the saying, the internet never forgets. Once you share something, it's out there and it will be there forever. And it's really, really hard to delete and keep track of. So this is where, what we as human beings, the right to be forgotten that we actually, is a need or is it a right for us in the technology are not aligned. And kind of this needs to be resolved, but this is also kind of a broader issue than what a company or a group or an organization can do. This is something that we as a society need to solve together. Yeah. Thanks, Armin. And, you know, I, I mean, really important conversation that we're having here today. And Jesse, thanks. I know you've been putting some resources in the chat. What, can you talk a little bit about the resource that you have um, on securing devices and accounts? And what was the goal? What was the purpose of that document? And if you want to speak to anything else that you put in the chat, I know those are really helpful resources. I think I saw one on data brokers. So, um, yeah, please go ahead. Yep, I've, I've just been adding them as the topics that they're on come up in conversation. Um, we actually have a whole survivor resources toolkit that um, every that the resource I'm about to talk about and also everything I've been linking to um, is part of. Um, so the uh, s securing uh, devices and accounts resource, um, that is something where, like I said, before I was the um, primary author and it was part of it's part of our partnership with um, you know with, with, with Norton with, with Jen um, and the idea with this was that so many so many survivors and and so many providers like they don't they don't necessarily know where to start, but also they may just have questions about a wide variety of like tech topics because sometimes it's hard to assess what's going on or sometimes it just seems very complicated to secure accounts. And so this was meant to provide chunks of information. Um, so it's got a uh, you know, if you click through to the PDF uh, from the landing page that I think Andrew posted earlier, or, yeah, that I think Andrew posted earlier, um, you can see that there's a table of contents with numerous um, different sections that are are labeled by what what type they are, like uh, devices, consistent access to safer phones, um, and so, and we kind of decided to divide it into two big chapters, one of which is if you're still living with the abusive person or in close contact, and the other is if you are no longer living with or physically around the abusive person. Um, and so there are, and then within those, the big topics are devices, accounts, and using the internet. And so it's meant to cover a whole wide range of topics 
at a level that people who um, do not have specialized expertise in tech, like whether that's survivors or providers, um, a, a, a level that makes, you know, wording that makes sense, that is not jargon heavy, that is accessible. Um, and when possible, it's also, because I, I see there's a comment in the chat about not having um, financial programs, not having financial resources uh, for certain tools. That's that's really true. And so whenever possible in this resource um, and in the resources in general, I try to discuss free options and ways to reduce costs. Um, and then I might also talk about uh, options that are, are more expensive because for people who are able to access them, able to get funding through a program, they can be really useful. But for the most part, these aren't tech tools. They're um, ways to use tech, ways to protect yourself with tech you already have, um, ways to protect yourself from misuse of tech by others with tech that you already have, um, and making use of resources that may be free, like a local library, for instance. Um, so I, I, I'm really glad that uh, Elizabeth brought up the financial accessibility issue. And in some ways, that's the heart of this webinar because um, th the reason that we're having it is the, uh, you know, the, the donation program um, that is part of this partnership. Thanks so much, Jesse. And um, we will get to everybody's questions, I'm I'm hoping. So please do keep them asking. Um, and I think, yeah, and Nason just put in the the webs in the uh, chat that we will be talking more about the product donation at a later point. But um Aaron, so from from the Norton perspective, um, can you talk about the partnership with NNEDV? the National Network to End Domestic Violence, and the Safety Net Project. How does the Norton pro donation program through TechSoup tech fit within this framework? Yeah, absolutely, Kim. I'd be happy to kind of provide a little bit of context around that. So Jen, through its uh, earlier consumer brands, including Norton, has long supported organizations working to protect people from tech abuse. And, and the company was a founding member, for instance, of the Coalition of Stalkerware several years ago. And now we have kind of expanded and really deepened our commitment to this issue with the partnership with NNEDV. It's a three-year partnership really focusing on helping to expand the resources that are available through the safety net program, which existed before this partnership, but our support is helping to uh, provide the resources for the development of the guide, you know, that Jesse has completed and for other resources as well. Uh, in addition, the safety net team is working in-house with another NNEDV team called Economic Justice, which is looking at the intersection between um, financial abuse and tech facilitated abuse, because of course, once you start talking about online banking and all of online shopping and, um, retirement accounts and savings accounts and all of these things that are the intersection of your financial stability, your identity, your privacy. Um, the tech piece of this is, of course, really important in, in people's lives. And so those two teams are now able to come together a little bit more with some of the resources from Norton to develop resources that will help to educate and raise awareness about the intersections of those risks and vulnerabilities for these populations. Um, and we're also helping to enable NNEDV to continue partnering in advisory conversations where they are helping to talk about what it would take for tech companies and others in the tech community to minimize opportunities for tech abuse. So we can stop addressing this problem after it's happened and stop trying to tell people how to fix a problem that they've encountered, but actually start to prevent it in other ways. Um, and the donation program now with TechSoup 
is an idea that was long time in the making. So we have a donation program with TechSoup specifically to provide our um, products to organizations, to nonprofit organizations to secure themselves and, and their work. Um, but after looking into this issue and recognizing our commitment toward victims and survivors of domestic violence, we started speaking to TechSoup about whether there was a way to um, facilitate the donation of these products, so the Norton 360 and the Norton VPN, to uh, individuals. But we also recognized, you know, we could just donate directly to individuals, but actually this is a very vulnerable population facing circumstances where they need support. And especially when we're talking about this technology, they may not have access to the resources. They may be intimidated by the technology itself. And we wanted to really be able to provide these donations to individuals with a kind of complete wraparound set of services and resources. So we worked hard to be able to create a program where that donation is going through trusted vetted organizations um, in within the TechSoup community and also relying on NNDV and the resources which you know, they have developed over many years and their expertise in this community to make sure that we are delivering something to victims and survivors that is really useful, that really provides the services and also has, you know, um, the depth that that they need to really gain the awareness of the issues that they're facing, the risks that they have and the support to be able to face those things head on and really know what, um, what problems they're encountering, what they can really fix with our products, what they need to fix with a more comprehensive safety plan, et cetera, because we know that every situation is individual and we wanna make sure that we're part of a community offering services and not just you know one-off product donation, which is not necessarily going to help uh, in every situation exactly the same way. That's great, thanks, Erin. Uh, Jesse, I'm gonna go to you. And so in light of what Aaron said, and you heard about, you know, the, the Norton partnership, which you, you obviously know about, how will equipping survivors devices with products like Norton um, be beneficial to their online and digital safety and security? Do you think there are any limitations? What are some other security precautions and tools that must be used in addition to those offered by Norton? And then Armin, I'm gonna uh, go over to you for the, for the follow-up on that. So Jesse, please. Thanks, Kim. Um, so I, I think, I mean, I think that for one thing, um, the Norton tools can be really good for basic cyber hygiene. Um, and, you know, a lot of, a lot of abusers may not, they may not be technologically sophisticated themselves, like they're not they're not developing malware um, that, that they may not even know, um, you know, they may not know how they would use it, how they would get it onto someone's phone, but that, that doesn't make cyber hygiene irrelevant um, because well, for, for one thing, um, a lot of products that they can help guard against um, things like stalkerware that can be uh, really, in, really invasive. Um, Norton products can also help with um, like online data removal. Um, I know that the Norton VPN was mentioned earlier um, and what a VPN does um, in, in simple terms is it's, disguising the IP address, the, the, the approximate location of your devices um, when you use the internet. And so for somebody who has relocated, for instance, um, who doesn't want their abuser to find them, uh, this can be this can be very important because it means that if, a company's data gets stolen, for instance, if the IP addresses of their users get stolen, um, or if the abuser does something highly technological like impersonating uh, a service provider's website, um, 
the IP address won't reveal where the survivor is. So all, all of these are, are just, um, they're really helpful services uh, and products. There's no, sadly, there's no product or service that is going to be the end all be all um, that, that is going to solve the problem. Um, and this goes back to what I said before about individualized safety planning and how tech safety planning is just part of safety planning. Um, and so people are always going to need um, a wide variety of options that include, um, you know, that, that, that include VPNs, that include um, applications to help with um, to help with cyber hygiene. Um, but it may well go beyond. It, it, something may well go beyond that. Like if someone. If someone lives with their abuser um, and their abuser can see what they do on devices, then uh, an antivirus program, like it's not, it's not going to be that survivor's biggest concern, probably like safety planning around using tech, maybe. And, and this scenario is actually covered in uh, the, the securing devices and accounts resource. Um, so th th there's uh, and uh, another another thing I think that is worth mentioning is that survivors may not always be in control of all their tech safety even when they have relocated. Um, they might be moving from shelter to shelter for a while, like they might be in a homeless shelter. Um, they're the victim service provider they're using might be in a building with security cameras and the, and the victim service provider doesn't have control over um, how well the security camera data is protected. Um, so this can, they may be staying with a friend and don't have ultimate control over, you know, how, how the friends Wi-Fi network is, is set up. Um, so the, these are these are the types of things that can come up. Also, very often domestic violence, sexual violence, it's not the only thing that's going on in a survivor's life. Um, there may be elements of racism, homophobia, poverty in general. Um, that are combining with the effects of gender-based violence um, and, and that introduce their own kinds of tech security concerns. Like, you know, what if someone is gay and, and they're in a country where same-sex relationships are illegal and they're experiencing domestic violence? Like that, that introduces, you know, <clears throat> What if they flee that country and are an asylum seeker? <clears throat> that suddenly introduces a whole lot of other possible tech safety considerations. Um, so it's, it's, I mean, you know, I, I personally, like, I'm, I'm Jewish and I have certainly experienced, like, anti-Semitism that intersected with tech safety. I am part of the LGBTQ community and I have experienced uh, homophobia, biphobia, transphobia um, that has intersected with tech safety. And so it's all part of like this big picture, a sort of like quilt of different patches, made of different patches for every survivor a quilt to wrap around and provide help. <laughs> Thanks, Jesse. That was a really that was really insightful. Um, I think we're getting some good questions here in the chat. And I think um, Armin, I think I'm going to ask you in terms of the Norton technology that we were talking about, mm -hmm. 
um, or just other technology to help in general. There's a question about, um, does this work for mobile only? Many have people have government phones and might not have all the tech to use on these phones. Do you have thoughts on that? Uh, yeah, I, I'm not sure if I understand the question. So there is like, we have yeah, products I think... for, for different applications, so like for different devices. So we have a product for mobile device, for your desktop or laptop computers. Uh, we have services that scan the internet online for your information. So different deployment scenarios. I think if it's a government phone, I don't know this term, so, but often these phones, if you receive it from a company or from, from somebody else, if it's not like something that we buy in the open market, they are more restricted than other ones. So you might be restricted in the terms of the software that you can install there. So that might that might be true, but I, I can't give a very general answer to that because like I don't know what this yeah. what the government phone entails. I can follow up on the on the government piece of that. I carried a government phone for many years and um, they government technology, they don't allow you to add technology. So it is something mm -hmm. to think about, right? Um, mm -hmm. And something that's a consideration to talk to the tech people at the, wherever they work with the government about if there's an issue. So um, I, another question um, that I see is, are there specific, and again, maybe Armin first, and then are there specific tools or applications that survivors can use to proactively monitor and manage their, manage their digital footprint that minimizes the use risk of unwanted exposure. What should be considered when selecting such a resource? Uh, yes, so we have we have monitoring tools like our, our LifeLock identity monitoring that checks if your name is being used in uh, certain yeah scenarios like uh, I don't know taking on a mortgage and, and whatever. So there's different ways of how this is monitored. We have other products that. Um, look at the public databases if your name appears there uh, and then you get a warning or also on the dark web so this is like the data that's being traded on the digital black market uh, between data brokers and, and well so wants to participate or advertisers or governments i don't know who, who consumes all this data so we also have access to this type of data and check if your credentials like your name or your address phone number vehicle uh, number plate stuff if this appears there and then you get notifications so that you become aware removing or reducing this footprint this is kind of a bigger challenge so we would also have products in, in that sense uh, like that's what we call the, that's our reputation defender and this comes in different um comes in different uh, sizes so on the higher end it's, it's it's a very expensive service because removing data is a very manual and labor intensive process so we can't offer that for free or something because it's a big effort of scrubbing the internet of data that's out there often unfortunately as i said earlier this is kind of is one of the biggest drawbacks um still it's good to get a sense of uh, how the data appears or how people who look for you uh might find what, what they might find about you so this is and and, and that, that this is kind of a lower entry of barrier as i said we use it for marketing purposes so you can get a sense get, get a sense of that without paying a whole lot of money you can use the products to monitor this over time and get reports about this and uh if you want to get want to get into removal then uh yeah this is more expensive thing. thanks herman i think um jesse we also had another question and you feel free to um expand on what armin just mentioned too but um is there any preserve about data brokers which we had talked about before are there any particular services you recommend to remove that information that data brokers have or remove your information from data broker sites? So we, uh, SafetyNet at NNEDV, we don't, we don't specifically endorse products among other things because products can change and new products can come on the market. Um, but in, in addition to what I mean, already said about Norton's own products, some examples of, of products um, would include um, Delete Me, uh, which comes to mind just because it's it's the one that I use. Um, and um, Nord's uh, Incogni is another one. Um, one Rep is 
an option that has some amount of uh, tra trade-off with affordability and automation. Um, we actually discuss a few in um, the, the data broker resource that I linked to earlier. And again, these are all just examples of products because mm -hmm. they could go off the market. They could something about their quality could change. Um, it, so I'll always do your, your due diligence. Um, one thing too about some of these products is that they have, they have family plans, group plans, um, that, that kind of thing. And this can potentially make these products more affordable for survivors who don't have a lot of financial resources because um i mean one it tends to be a little cheaper per person and two you can potentially get a, a few people together to have a group or family plan um combining their resources um instead of it costing a certain amount you know you get together with three other people and now it's a certain amount uh divided by four um so that like the, these do cost money is part of my point there are ways to make them more affordable and it's also possible to remove oneself from data brokers manually either as a comprehensive thing or being able to figure out quickly the ones that are most likely to have an impact on you and remove yourself from those. And I talk in detail about those free options, those free but somewhat labor intensive options um, in uh, the data brokers resource. It's not technologically hard to do. You just use the company's websites it, it just takes a while because um, there's a lot of them. And so the, the, there are there are several different options is, is, is what this comes down to. That's helpful. Um, it, it, we're, we're, I realize we're getting a little close to the end of time and I will leave um, a wrap up a few minutes, um, a brief few minutes for wrap up, but um, we are getting some more questions in the chat, which are really, I think, very interesting. Um, it, and maybe this is for Aaron and Arma and Armin to like tag team on, um, but in the situation where a survivor still resides with the abuser and the abuser is knowledgeable about tech and the abuser installs tracking apps to monitor activity on the survivor's mobile phone, is this something that Norton 360 would help combat? And I'll go to Armin first. Uh, yes, so if it's part of a, for example, if on the phone, uh, well, if something like a spyware that we know or have identified as a spyware would be installed, then this would be like, uh, this application would be detected on the, on the laptop, for example, if it's the antivirus uh, on the phone, depending if it's an Android phone or an iOS phone, level of access that you have to the operating system, we could detect it or not. Um, so basically the answer is, is yes. Uh, if somebody comes up and does a lot of effort and builds their own application or stuff that we haven't seen before, which is kind of very unlikely actually, but not just for that matter, then it would be held up. Typically people put together stuff in, in this kit, sort of buy it, and uh, we got a good coverage because it's like part of the threat landscape that we observe. And um, so whenever we can, we're going to detect. That's great. I don't know, Aaron, if you wanted to expand on that or even to talk about any additional products that Norton may have coming out to protect vulnerable groups. Um, just to, I think, maybe clarify, and, and Armin, please correct me, but the, the Norton 360 will detect that if the Norton is already on the phone, right? So, so the important thing is, or will it detect it if you add the Norton 360 once, you know, if the, if the stalkerware is already there, I'll just. Uh, yeah, yes, if you can observe it, and as I said, operating different operating system, allow us a different level of mm -hmm. access to see what else is on the phone. 
So in Android, we were able to see, for example, what the other applications are. And iOS is more restrictive. They don't show this to us, so we, we, we wouldn't detect if it's, uh, but uh, there is also kind of how this application gets on the phone. Mm -hmm. You can't, you could get it through the regular uh, Apple store or Play Store and Google, you wouldn't get such an application because uh, they don't, they have policies that don't allow that and they have their own process of filtering out these applications from getting on their marketplaces. So you would need to install these applications through most of the time through a backdoor, which is kind of a more uh, technical, the technical level, level to do that is, is higher. I mean, it's not impossible, but it, it's higher and you need to get the application there. I mean, what everyone can check for themselves, just like a quick check is to see on the phone if there is a developer mode enabled or not. So if a developer mode is enabled, then uh, this gives other people, this would give enable people to actually install new software there without the uh, Apple store or the Google store. So that's just a quick check that comes to mind right now. Yeah, just to, I guess, just to highlight that, you know, the the Norton 360 and then also the standalone VPN, you know, these can be part of the the cyber hygiene that, that people should be trying to practice. Um, Kind of all the time already in in their in their lives, and that they can contribute to alerting someone that something strange is going on on their phone or on their device that they may need to check into or that they may need to check out with someone who can help them figure out what's going on. Um, yeah, I would just add that. Thank you both. Um, I think we'll head to final thoughts now. There is a question that was in the chat that I think is a pretty meaty and deserves a really good answer that we don't have time for right now. So um, I will leave it to Nason to work with the, the panelists to figure out how to get this answered. But what should organizations and agencies take into consideration when creating a policy around tech safety? That's a really big question. Um, I think we probably could have taken a part of, a, you know, a big chunk of this time to discuss that. So we'll make sure that that gets an answer. Um, I want to thank you all for participating today. I'm just going to give you a quick one minute for final thoughts before we sign off. Thank you to everyone who participated and sent questions and, and all of that today. Um, but I'll start with um, Armin and then Aaron and then Jesse, I'll leave you with the last words. Armin, any final thoughts? Oh. Oh yeah, sorry. Yes, uh, yeah. Thank you very much, everyone, for participating. I think this is a great first step in creating this awareness in kind of getting into the mode of practicing cyber hygiene. Uh, one thing that's very important for me—it was raised in the last panel that I participated in. F financials are should not be a barrier. We as a company are not about that. About this digital divide for the products of Norton, we also have like from our other brands like Avast or ABG, there's kind of premium options. So the protection level is basically the same. Uh, it's it's just a different brand. It's uh, And of course you can buy the premium product as well, but for a basic security, uh, I think these things cover you well if you don't have the financial resources as well. So I would also recommend looking into those if you're looking for our, our security solutions. So that being said, thank you very much. And uh, and over to the next person. Thanks, Armin. <laughs> Aaron, quickly, anything? Yeah. Anything no just um thank you everyone for participating and also for sharing with us in the chat some of the issues that you're also facing um and seeing in your communities i think that's really important for us to know and just you know want to reiterate that these issues don't really know any demographic boundaries that there are people in you know in all of our communities facing circumstances and facing potentially these risks and the more that we know and understand the services that are available in our communities that can help people with with these challenges and help serve them, I think the better. So huge thanks to everybody, Armin and, and Kim and Jesse, and of course our colleagues at TechSoup for facilitating this conversation. Thank you all so much. Jesse, take us home. <laughs> Thank you. All right, I'll try to be brief since I know we're at time. Um, just. Thank you all for attending. Um, we do provide, uh, we meaning safety net at NNEDV, we do provide technical assistance around particular cases or tech safety issues that organizations are having trouble with or just, just want more information about. 
Um, we have a lot of resources for organizations on our website. Um, we do have a general informational listserv, um, the safety net info listserv that advertises things like upcoming trainings, um, which if you email me at jlowell at nedv.org, I, I will get you added to that. Um, and also, if you're interested in this, if you're interested in this stuff in general, um, we do have a webinar on encryption basics for programs uh, coming up on two different dates and times next uh, in, in December, which I am posting the two different registration links. Um, one for the 5th and one for the 11th. Uh, in the chat, there are two to accommodate as many time zones as possible for an international audience. And, and I think it has the specific time info at the links. Thank you again for attending. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Have a great rest of your day. Thank you.